Hello, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about gravity. We're going to reenact one of the most famous experiments ever done, in my opinion, uh, involving gravity. And we're going to do it in slow motion so we can see exactly how it unfolds at the smallest units of time. So you may have heard, maybe you haven't, I don't know, that all objects on Earth fall or accelerate downward at the same rate. Now, you might say, well, that's not true. If you take a feather, right, here's a feather, and a hammer, right, uh, and you drop them, right, they're obviously not going to fall at the same rate. One, two, three, you can just tell immediately that the hammer hits the ground at the, same, at the uh, first, right, and the feather goes later. Uh, it turns out that this experiment was done on the surface of the moon by the Apollo astronauts. They actually held a hammer at shoulder height here, or at waist height, and a feather that they brought from the Earth, and they drop them in the vacuum, which is the surface of the moon, and they go down at exactly the same rate and hit the ground at the same time, unlike this, where the hammer clearly is hitting the ground first. But what I wanted to do was to try to reenact that experiment, right? And of course, I don't have the moon here, um, so I decided to do it inside of a vacuum chamber. And inside of my vacuum chamber, I couldn't fit a full-blown hammer, and it was also uh, very cumbersome, so I decided to do the experiment with uh, magnets, which are also fairly heavy, much heavier than a feather. Uh, but also, instead of uh, just feathers, I decided to do it with confetti, uh, feathers, and also glitter, very fine particle glitter. I think you can imagine that if you sprinkle glitter and a hammer, or any kind of metal, that that glitter is going to turn into a cloud and just kind of very slowly go down, and obviously uh, air resistance is going to stop it from hitting the ground at the same time. But if you suck all of the air out of the situation, everything hits the ground at the same time. So that's what we did. I want to film it and show it to you in slow motion. And the way that I have my chamber set up, I have a magnet on the top holding what's uh, on the roof of the vacuum chamber on the inside, and then as I, as I lift up, then I've released the magnets and then the items can fall down on the inside. So let's go take a look at it in slow motion, and then we'll talk about it. At the very top of the vacuum chamber, almost off the frame, you can see me lifting my fingers, which is removing a magnet from the outside. That releases the magnets that I have on the inside, which were holding up the feathers on the left side of the frame. Now you can see in this first experiment, I haven't pumped any air out of the chamber. There's still air in this chamber. And you can see that the magnets clearly hit the ground before the feathers, simply because the feathers are encountering air resistance as they float down and flutter down to the ground. This is pretty much what you would see if you did it outside in the backyard. Now this time I've pumped the air out of the chamber and I want you to focus your attention on the blue feather. That seems to have the best result because the magnet was directly holding that blue feather down. You can see that small square magnet hitting the ground at the same time as the feather. Now if you look at the other feathers, you can also see that they're pretty much hitting the ground very, very close to the same time as the magnets that were holding those guys to the roof of the chamber. Now here's the same shot again, but I'm zooming in so you can really see the details of the feathers hitting the ground at the same time as the magnet. Notice the red feather hitting the ground at the same time as its magnet, along with the blue feather hitting the ground along with its magnet. Super counterintuitive, but this is the way the universe works. Here I'm dropping some paper confetti along with some magnets, and in this case there is air in the chamber. I'm doing it as a control, so you can clearly see how the magnet is accelerating down faster and slamming into the ground before the bulk of the confetti gets there. Now remember what this looks like, we're going to do it with the air pumped out next. So here we've pumped the air out of the chamber, and you can see the same effect as with the feathers. When there's no air getting in the way, causing air resistance, the magnet and the confetti travel very closely as a group, hitting the ground very close to the same time. Of course, it's not exact because I cannot pump all of the air from the chamber, but you can see a clear difference from the previous take with air. And just for giggles, this is the confetti in the tank after I put all the air back into the tank. So this is a slow motion shot of air rushing into the chamber, stirring up all of the confetti. 
Now this is really cool. I found some glitter that's obviously very lightweight metallic glitter and I'm dumping it in directly in the atmosphere so there's air resistance in the way. Notice how the glitter cloud stretches vertically and it doesn't travel as a group. It kind of spreads out and turns into a cloud clearly because the air is interfering with the fall of each individual particle. Now contrast that with this case when I've pumped the air out. This is super cool. When we release it, the glitter travels as a clump because there's no air to disperse it. And it's traveling down and hitting the ground as the same time as the magnet. Notice the magnet is not magnetizing these particles. They're just falling at the same rate. All right, I hope you found that interesting. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I look at that footage, it looks unnatural. And obviously it is unnatural because we live in an atmosphere. So we're very used to seeing things, uh, you know, not hit the ground at the same time. Here's a piece of paper and a marker. Obviously the paper lands secondly, but that's only because of air resistance, right? And we saw there that things do indeed hit the ground at the same time when you suck the air out. And even in my vacuum chamber, I'm not allowed, I'm not able to suck all the air out. So there's still a little bit there, uh, but it was enough to hopefully get the point across. Now, the million dollar question is, why do ev does everything fall at the same rate on the Earth? If you were to hold a golf ball and a bowling ball, they would hit the ground at the same time. If you would hold a 10 you know, kilogram weight and a one kilogram weight and drop them, they would hit the ground at the same time. But it's very clear that items with more mass have more force of gravity. Gravity is pulling down harder on the heavier item. So why doesn't it hit the ground at the same time? It seems very odd. So that's what I wanna talk about today. I wanna to do it two different ways. The first way, I wanna explain it to you without any math or anything other than just talking. But then I wanna to go to the board and just do five minutes of writing some stuff down and I think you'll get a deeper understanding of what's going on. I really hope that you stick with me to the end. It's, I think it's worth your time, let me put it that way. All right, so imagine a bowling ball, imagine a golf ball. The bowling ball is definitely being pulled down harder with a higher force of gravity. So shouldn't it go down faster and hit the ground? Well, you would think so, yes, but there's one big thing that most people, when you first think about this, are not considering. It is true that the golf ball is being pulled, I'm sorry, that the bowling ball, it is true, is being pulled down harder with a higher force of gravity than a golf ball. But that, that bowling ball has more mass, and because of that, it has a higher inertia. It is harder to get a higher massive things, it's harder to get them to start moving. Right? So the bowling ball is being pulled down harder, but it's also harder to get going. It's harder to get moving. So the force of gravity is pulling down on it harder, but it's difficult to get the bowling ball to begin moving compared to something that doesn't have as much mass like a golf ball. If you were to go to deep space and grab a car and push on the car, it would be very hard to push the car. You could do it because you're in space, but you, it'd be very hard. You have to give a lot of effort to get it going, but it would take no effort at all to throw that golf ball. Right? Things with mass resist motion. We call it inertia. Right? Would you rather be, uh, would you rather it if I throw a golf ball at you or if I throw a bowling ball at you? Well, the bowling ball is going to have a lot more inertia. Same velocity as the golf ball. It's going to hurt a lot more when that bowling ball hits. It has more inertia. It's difficult to, to get it moving and it's more difficult to stop it from moving. That's why very heavy cars, you know, they, they can do a lot of damage in a car accident because they're very, very massive. Right? Um, it is true that the golf ball, or that the bowling ball, is being pulled down harder. Um, but at the same time, it is more difficult to get the ball moving, and those two effects cancel out. And so when you compare it to the golf ball, it's being pulled down with less of a force of gravity, but it's much easier to get the golf ball moving. And those two effects cancel out. So the golf ball and the bowling ball actually fall at the same rate all the way down, 9.8 meters per second squared at the surface approximately, on Earth. Different planets have different acceleration of gravity. Sun is much, much higher, Jupiter's higher. The moon is much lower for uh, acceleration due to gravity. But in every gravitational field, no matter what planet you're on, everything falls at the same rate, no matter uh, if you ignore air resistance or atmospheric resistance. And so that's what the experiment they did on the moon. So one more time, the golf ball is much lighter. It is being pulled down less. However, it is very easy to get that thing moving. Right? The bowling ball, much, much heavier, being pulled down much, much harder. However, it is difficult to get moving. And so those two effects cancel out so that everything falls at the same rate. So that is the explanation without any math. I think it's a really good explanation and it's factually correct. But let's go a level deeper. It's not very difficult to do. 
All right, Newton discovered force, something called the force of gravity, right? And so I'm gonna call it F sub G. And if you've never seen this, don't worry, it's not very complicated. G, capital G, is just a number, it's a constant, times the mass of the object times the mass of the Earth. We're talking about force of gravity, so the mass of the Earth is here, divided by R squared, where R is the distance you know, between them. And you can think of, you know, this would be the Earth right here, and then this might be the Moon, and there's some distance between the Earth and the Moon called R. Right? And so there's the mass of the moon, the mass of the earth. And so you multiply the two masses of whatever it is is attracting each other, divide by r squared, and you have this constant out here called the gravitational constant. So this is how hard is pulling, that's how, how, how much force is acting on the bowling ball down. You know, where the mass of the earth goes here, very big number, the mass of the bowling ball goes here and the distance between the bowling ball and the center of the earth is there. The golf ball doesn't have as much mass so it's not gonna have as much force. That's all in equation form wrapped up in what we just said. Bowling balls are pulled down harder than golf balls, all right? So you would think that if it were bigger, there would be a higher force of gravity and that would pull it down faster. But there's another part of it, the inertia. What equation governs or describes inertia? There's a few ways to look at it, but there's a very famous equation, one of Newton's laws. Um, this guy Newton was really important. F is equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration. In other words, if I push on an object with a certain mass, then it will accelerate at a certain rate. And I can use algebra to solve for this. I can say that the acceleration is equal to the force divided by the mass. Just divide both sides by M, right? So this governs how much the Earth is pulling on the object, the bowling ball. And once I know the force, I put it in here, and divide by the mass of the object, and this calculates how fast it's gonna go down and hit the ground. That's what's going on here. So you would think that if you have a bowling ball with a higher mass, there's a bigger force, bigger force goes into here, bigger acceleration. However, the only way to get the bigger force is to have a bigger mass. But the bigger mass also appears in the bottom. So the bigger force is pulling down, but you're dividing at the same time by a bigger mass. And when I said earlier that those two effects cancel out, I meant it quite literally. The mass of the object doesn't matter. When we say that two objects, any two objects, will hit the ground at the same time, what we're saying is that the mass of the object doesn't affect anything. It doesn't affect how fast it falls. It's independent of the mass of the object. So let's show how that happens. If we know that the force of gravity is here, we'll just plug it in right here and see how fast it accelerates down. Well, the force of gravity is given by all this stuff, G, M, uh, M sub E, uh, over r squared, and then divided by m right here. Now anything, uh, you can think of it uh, as itself over one, so you can just flip and multiply, however you wanna think about doing your algebra. Flip and multiply puts the masses on the bottom, or you can just think of it, since they're both on the top right here, you can think of cancel, cancel, right? And so what you have is that the acceleration that everything is gonna come down uh, to the ground is gonna be g times the mass of the earth divided by r squared, but on the bottom, there's nothing here. There's a one and a one, so it disappears. So what we're saying is that the acceleration of any object coming down only depends on the mass of the Earth and the distance it is from the center of the Earth. The mass of the object is not in here at all. And so that means that we call it G, which is a constant. And in our case, in Earth, at the surface, 9.8 meters per second squared. If you put the mass of the Earth in here, multiply by the gravitational constant, and then divide by the radius of the Earth that would be at the surface of the Earth, you will get 9.8 meters per second squared. That's where G comes from. And it comes from the fact that even if I take a, something heavy like a, like a car, you know, two tons or something, convert it to kilograms or whatever, and I put it in here and multiply, I get a higher force of gravity, true. That will be a bigger number here. However, I will be dividing by a larger number. A heavier item accelerates slower. That's a, a, a more massive item accelerates slower because you're dividing by the mass. So there's a higher force of gravity, but it makes it accelerate slower, and those two effects quite literally cancel out. The higher force coming from the mass and the, and the mass on the bottom cancel out, so that in the end, the acceleration of gravity doesn't even depend on the mass of the object. And the only re real reason that we think that's weird is because when we drop things, we see all the time that they land at the same time, at, at different times, but that's only because of air resistance. 
So if you suck all of the air out of the room, everything will hit the ground at the same time. Even something really heavy like a, I don't know, a spaceship and a penny. They will hit the ground at the same time as evidence and as by shown by this experiment with the, the glitter and all the other things. So that's all I had for you today. I wanted to show it to you, slow motion. I wanted to explain it to you with no math and then put some math in it uh, to really wrap our brains around what's going on here. I'd like you now at this point to drop me a line. Let me know. What, do you, what would you like to see different? What would you, which direction would you like me to go? Was it too much, too little? Please let me know. I read every comment and I'll see you in the next one. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.